Good morning once again, everybody. If you would, please go ahead and open up your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. We're in chapter 2. And uh, this is the second sermon in the book of Thessalonians. And I've challenged you, rather just more than challenged, just politely asked you if you could try to make the effort to be here for the next nine consecutive Sundays. Uh, thank you for your participation in that today, by the way. Um, but the reason that I want you to be here is because this, I believe with all my heart, this sermon series is so pivotal for our church because we're talking about hope. And uh, that's why we're studying 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians has a lot of content in it. There's five chapters um, and there's a lot of topics that it touches on. But the one topic that seems to be repeated and emphasized more than any other is the second coming of Christ. Each chapter talks about the second coming of Christ. And as Christians, can there be any better hope than that day when Jesus will call us home and we can leave this messy world behind? But until that day happens, we're learning how hope is supposed to be lived out for you and me and ultimately for our church here at Burnside Christian Church. Do you remember the definition that we gave you as to what hope is? We're going to be giving it to you a week after week. Uh, but the definition that we're working with is the confident expectation that better things are ahead. The confident expectation that better things are ahead. Why is it that you stick with that job that's tough and that boss who just rides you so hard all the time? Why is it that you're in that marriage and you choose to stay in that marriage that's tough and difficult? It's because you have hope, right? That better days are ahead. That it's not always going to be this way. And I believe with all my heart that the church needs to be the place where you get your hope tank refilled. That we have got to remind one another that, look, I know this week was hard, but this week's going to be better. And that things will improve for you. And Jesus is coming soon. And stick with it. We're almost there. I believe that with my entire heart and with my entire being. I want you to believe that things tomorrow, things in the future, are going to be better for you as an individual, but also for us as a church. The glory days are not in the rearview mirror. The glory days are down the road yet to come. And I need you to believe that. Because until we have hope, until we have the confident expectation that things are going to get better, we're going to be depressed. We're going to be negative. We're going to be critical. We're going to have a hard time finding joy. And I want us to be a joy-filled church until Jesus comes. So today, we're in chapter 2 in this sermon series talking about hope. And specifically in chapter 2, uh, we're going to be learning how the church works. And um, we're going to be studying all of chapter 2 uh, eventually, but today we're only studying half of it. But in order for hope to be experienced at Burnside Christian Church, in order for us to come to the realization that better days are ahead, two things have to happen. And that's what chapter 2 talks about. The first thing that has to happen is that your spiritual leaders, your elders, your preacher, your youth minister, your spiritual leaders have to do their job. They have to do what they've been commissioned and called by God to do. If we're going to experience hope, your leaders need to get it together and we've got to do what we've been called to do. But there's a second part. The second part is that in order for hope to be stoked within our church, y'all have to do your job. Okay? Well, I was going to originally tackle this all in one sermon, but there's just too much here, and so we're going to be tackling it into two uh, weeks, really. So today, we get to talk about my job. Okay? And, and I, really, I really wish we didn't have to. I mean, it, it's not a whole lot of fun to have a public review of your job, right? That this is how you're supposed to be, and this is how things are. Not a whole lot of fun to talk, but I'm really looking forward to next week where we get to talk about your job. But I have to be faithful to what the text says. And we're a church who believes the Bible. We're a church that preaches the Bible, for better or for worse. If it's in there, we're going to talk about it. And this is where Paul talks about and this is where he starts. So today, we're going to be learning how the church should work. And we're going to be hoping for God's best in our leaders here at Burnside Christian Church. 
for the elders. We're going to be hoping for God's best for Mark Nichols. We're going to be hoping for God's best in Kyle Nelson. We're going to be hoping for God's best in your leaders. And I think you're going to see this um, in, in our text here this morning. And so if you're a note taker, uh, jot this down. Uh, hope for your church leaders to be. Because in our text this morning, just the first 12 verses, in our text this morning, Paul gives us three things that we should hope for in your spiritual leaders. Here's the first thing to hope for your spiritual leaders to be. Hope for them to be faithful with God's truth as a servant. Faithful with God's truth as a servant. Let's begin studying our text. I think you'll see this very clearly. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and had been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. I want to pause right here just for a moment. Is anybody kind of sensing a little bit from Paul that he's being a little bit defensive? Like, why is he saying this? Why is he telling the, the Thessalonians about this? Well, here's why. You kind of have to understand the historical context. People in the first century, you know what they did for fun? You know what they did for entertainment? They didn't have movie theaters. They didn't have bowling alleys. They didn't have fine eating establishments. You know what they would, they didn't have game consoles. You know what they would do for fun? They would gather to the town square and they would listen to travel, traveling speakers who would come to their area and share. That's what they did for fun. Okay? And so what would happen is that these uh, speakers would come in from out of town and um, they would come from city to city and they would really do two things. These speakers that would come from out of town would first start off by flattering the audience. Well, I see we've got all the smart people from town in here today. Good for you. Man, you look so beautiful. I don't think I've ever seen that dress before. It looks so lovely on you. They would flatter their audience in order to get a large crowd. Man, I kind of like what he's saying. He, he's kind of rubbing me the right way. So he would flatter his audience, and then he would fleece his audience. Well, you know, I'd love to stay here and do this more, but there's, I, I just can't afford it. I, I, I've got to eat. I've got to provide money for my rent. So he would flatter you, and then he'd ask you for money. Don't you want to be a part of my ministry? Don't you want to support what's going on? That was their entertainment. And so, as we're walking through this, what Paul is doing as he's coming to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, he's like, I've got some things that I want to tell you and remind you about, but before we can get to the nitty-gritty of that, I've got to do my best to show you that I'm not that guy. I'm not the guy who's just simply coming here with my hand out, wanting you to, to give me all your money. And so he's got to address the elephant in the room a little bit today. Can I just say I kind of feel the same way with, when it comes to tele-evangelists? You know, you've seen them on TV. There's fancy suits. They're private jets. I sometimes am embarrassed to, to tell people I'm a preacher because in their mind, they associate preacher with a fleecer and a flatterer. Someone who's just out to get you to their church and to get your money from you. And that couldn't be further from the truth. And Paul is addressing it and he's, looking, he's saying, look, no, actually, I'm not that guy at all. And I think that you can see that in my ministry. Because faithful servants bear fruit. He's like, I'm a sincere preacher of Jesus Christ. And I think you can see that the proof is in the pudding. Okay? If I was just coming here with my hand out, looking to see what I could get from you, there would be no fruit involved in my ministry. That's what he says. Look at verse 1. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. And so that's the first proof that he's, the, he's not the flatterer, fleecer guy. The word vain, it means empty or hollow. And so Paul's like, look, our ministry was not empty. It wasn't hollow. It wasn't cotton candy. There was some meat to it. There was some substance to it. Things were happening. Lives were being changed. Fruit is the evidence of legitimacy. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, By their fruit you will know them. Hey, if there's never any oranges on the tree, don't tell me it's an orange tree. If there's never any apples on the tree, don't try to tell me it's an apple tree. 
if there's never any lives changed or souls converted, if there's never any prayers that are offered and answered, if nothing is happening, is God really involved in that ministry? And that's a slippery slope because, look, as a minister, as a youth minister, as elders, we are all too often critiqued by the fruit that is there. Okay? Well, man, the numbers were down this week. Attendance was lower than it was last year. Offerings are, are, are lower than they have been. We're judged by that kind of fruit all the time. And farmers, you know this better than anybody, and I think you'll relate to me very well in this. There's nothing that you can do to control the amount of fruit that's produced right? You can work hard, you can water, you can buy fertilizer, but there's nothing you can do to guarantee that the harvest is going to be what you want it to be. But here's the point, and I think that's the point of Scripture. There's always a harvest, though. There's always fruit, and that's the way it is with ministry. Yeah, the youth group may not be as big as you think it should be, and people may not be here as much as you think there should be, and the offerings may not be as big as what you think they should be, but fruit is happening. And there is work taking place. Faithful servants bear fruit. Hope for your leaders to be faithful with God's truth like a servant. And one way that you can tell that your spiritual leader is a faithful servant is by the fruit that is available in their life and in the church. Second way that you can tell your spiritual leaders are, um, are, uh, are, are a faithful servant is this. Faithful servants endure suffering. Look back at verse 2. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. You know what he's talking about here? What Paul is referring to here in this verse is he's talking about what happened to him back in Philippi. We studied it. We read about it in Acts chapter 16. You can read it again on your own time. Let me just summarize. Paul and Silas were with Paul in Philippi. Uh, Paul and Silas were together in Philippi. And Paul was sharing Jesus. And lives were being changed. And one life that was changed was this slave girl who was demon-possessed. And one thing that the, the, the demon allowed her to do was to tell the future. Well, she was a slave girl who was owned by some cruel masters who were just out to use her and to make money off of her. And when she got to know Jesus, guess what? That demon left her, and so did the ability to tell the future. And her masters were angry at Paul because they just went all their money. And so they took Paul, they took Silas, they had him arrested, they threw them in jail. And instead of being so bummed out for being arrested, for preaching and teaching and sharing Jesus and changing lives, guess what they were doing? At about midnight, they were singing and praising God in prison. And an earthquake happens. And when the earthquake happens, the prison doors fall open. And the jailer comes running in to see what has happened. And when he, he does, he sees all the, the, the doors to the prison that are open. And he was about to take his own life. You know why? Because if any prisoners escaped on your watch, Rome would put you to death. And he thought, well, I'm, they're all gone. I'm going to be put to death anyway. I might as well get this over with. Avoid the embarrassment. Avoid the hard questions. And right when he was getting ready to take his own life, Paul shouts out, and says, don't do anything, don't cause yourself any harm. We are all still here. And the jailer couldn't believe it. He's like, why didn't you guys run? Why didn't you try to think of yourself and escape? And in that moment, Paul's able to share Jesus with you because we, we love Jesus. We trust that he's going to take care of us. And in that moment, the jailer says, what must I do to be saved? You see, it's because Paul and Silas suffered in Philippi. It's because they didn't give up, that the gospel was advanced, that lives were changed, that fruit was had, that Christ was made known. They endured. They could have given up. They didn't give up, even when it was hard and uncomfortable. And one of the things that you should hope for in your elders and in your preacher and in your youth minister and in your Sunday school teachers, and for anyone who's leading you spiritually, what you should hope for in them is this, that when it gets hard, and trust me, it's going to get hard, 
Okay, If you're leading, it's going to get hard. Just buckle up and bear it. But pray for them and hope for them that when it gets hard, they will not quit. They will not quit. I think it's no secret that we are experiencing a preacher shortage in America. If you haven't understood that, you need to understand that. Bible colleges are producing fewer and fewer preachers and youth ministers and worship leaders and full-time servants for the church year after year. It's a crisis. And we need this hope now more than ever with your elders that we have here. We have four of them. We have Wayne Caparoon, Wayne Humphrey, Al Frakes, and Doug Jacob. We've got Kyle Nelson, and we've got myself, and my dad is our associate part-time. Those are the guys who are leading this church, who are thinking about and, and, and carry a burden on our hearts that is incomprehensible to a lot of you. Uh, pray for us that we would not quit when it gets hard, because it's going to get hard, and it has been hard in the past, but we've remained faithful. And Paul is like, one of the proofs that I was a sincere servant was that when it was hard, I didn't quit. If I was just here for money, I would have moved on to the next city a long time ago. Here's another proof. Paul says, faithful servants put truth above popularity. Boy, this is tough. But they put truth above popularity. Look at verses 3 through 6. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but pleasing God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with pretext for greed. We already touched on that, the, the fleecing, the flattering and the fleecing. We never came with flattering speech, as you know, no, know nor did a pretext for greed. God is our witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. If you're going to be speaking for Jesus Christ, if you're going to be teaching from God's Word, you need to understand that you cannot, you cannot change the content of God's Word to make it easier for you and more comfortable for your hearers. And one of the strengths, I believe, of Burnside Christian Church, long before I even became the preacher, but one of the strengths of Burnside Christian Church was that this church has always had a strong conviction to teach and to preach God's Word unapologetically. Now, we're going to do that with grace and gentleness and love, but we're going to stand on God's Word and teach what the Bible says. And guess what? That's not going to be popular with a lot of people in the world today. I received an email just this last week, somebody who was offended by something that was preached here in the pulpit. And um, had, it was a lengthy email, um, very lengthy email. My response was simply this, I, I'm sorry you feel that way. I really, I really hope it would have been received better. Uh, you know, If you'd like to continue this conversation, get a hold of me, let's meet in person. But I think my response would be best received in person rather than an email. And I didn't hear anything back, but I'm hopeful that we can sit down and have a conversation. But I'm just telling you, faithful servants of Jesus Christ will put truth before popularity. And sometimes that's really hard. If you're a teacher, if you're a leader, if you've had to put truth above being well-liked by everybody, you need to underline verse 4 in your Bible, circle it, lean on it, because you're going to need this verse. It says, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel... So we speak, not as pleasing men, but pleasing God who examines our hearts. That needs to be a verse of comfort for you. Because in the end, it matters not who gets upset, who gets all up in arms over what is said. We are simply servants. We don't write the message, we deliver the message, right? I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. But there's going to be people who don't like the message, and they're going to take it out on the servants. And uh, if this would describe something that you're having to deal with in the future, lean on verse 4. Make it your theme and life verse. 
hope for the leaders of this church to be faithful with the truth of God's Word, like a servant. Secondly, hope for God's leaders at Burnside Christian Church to be gentle with God's people like a mother. Returning to our text, look at verses 7 through 8. Paul says, But we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. I have to pause right here and tell a story. Whenever I hear the word gentle used in Scripture, you know the image that instantly comes to my mind? You won't be able to relate to it, maybe a little bit. But I think back to the very first dog that we had, Lindsay, as, we, as a married couple. We had a, a, a yellow lab mix. Her name was Callie. She was the best dog in the world. And one thing about Callie, though, was that she was very passionate about food. Loved food. So much so that whenever you wanted to give her a treat, you would tell her, sit, and she would sit, but then she would shake a little bit like this. And then what you'd have to tell her, and we learned this the hard way, but we eventually learned it. You'd have to tell her, gentle, gentle. And she got pretty good at that. She would open up her mouth and just draw close enough to get the treat from your hand without removing a finger. But before we learned to do that with her, we had, she was very aggressive and passionate about food. She wasn't very gentle when it came to food. And I have to tell you that some of you have grown up in churches before you came to Burnside. And maybe even looking back in my time here, maybe I, I wasn't as gentle with God's words, maybe what I should have been. That we are called to be gentle. We're passionate about this thing, but in our desire to be passionate about God's word, we have to be gentle. You know, Jesus said that the fields are ripe for harvest. And preachers, man, we get all rubbed up and we see the fruit and we're ready to pick it. Don't you want to accept Jesus? You need to accept Jesus. And you know what? While the fields are ripe for harvest, not every single piece of fruit is ready to be harvested. And so if you see a piece of fruit that needs to be harvested and it's not quite ready, don't damage the fruit. Leave it hang for somebody else to come in. And I think that's a good word here. We prove to be gentle among you. And then he uses this analogy, this metaphor of, of a mother tenderly caring for her children by nursing them. And now we come to verse 8, which is our theme verse. I don't know if you knew that or not. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. It's the theme verse of Burnside Christian Church. If you were here last week, I told you what the mission of Burnside Christian Church is. It's found in Matthew chapter 28. The mission of Burnside Christian Church, the purpose of why we, are, we exist, is to make disciples. I've worded it this way. We exist to bring people into a more committed relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it in a nutshell. Wherever you are in your steps for following Jesus Christ, we want to take you deeper. If you don't know Jesus, if you've never made a decision to follow, we want you to make a decision to follow Him. If you've already made the decision to follow Him, we're not satisfied just to leave you be. We want to take you deeper. We want you to be more committed. We want to disciple you. Does that make sense? So that's the, the mission of why Burnside Christian Church exists. Verse 8 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 is the vision for how we're going to accomplish the mission. I'll explain it after I read it. Verse 8 reads, Having so fond affection, affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives as well, because you'd become so very dear to us. The NIV translates it this way. It's the version that we use. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of Jesus Christ, but our lives as well. You see, how are we going to make disciples? How are we going to take people deeper? It begins with a relationship. I want to get to know you, and I want you to get to know me, and we're going to share life together, and I'm going to be transparent, and you're going to be transparent, and guess what? We're going to follow Jesus together. We were delighted to share with you not only our lives, but the gospel of Jesus Christ as well. And what Paul says he says, if you want to know what we were like with the church, if there's any question about how we behave towards you, we were like a nursing mother taking care of her children. 
this amazing tenderness combined with a commitment to the task of caring for church people is what you should hope for in the leaders of Burnside Christian Church. You should hope for your elders and your youth minister and your preaching minister and your associate minister to treat God's people with gentleness like a nursing mother. Hope for the best in your leaders. So what have we learned so far? Well, we've learned that uh, we should, as leaders, be faithful with God's truth like a servant. And we've learned that we should be uh, gentle with God's people like a mother. And as you think about the spiritual leaders of this church, as you think about Wayne Caproon and Wayne Humphrey and, and Doug Jacob and Al Frakes and Kyle Nelson and Mark Nichols and Dan Nichols, can you place us in one or two of these, one out of the two of these categories? Can you think about the leaders who are really truth people and they stand with great conviction on God's word? And then maybe there's other leaders in our church that um, choose to be more gentle. And man, they're all about grace and love. And I think sometimes we get caught up in the either-or category, right? I'm either a truth person or I'm a gentle person. And guess what? We're supposed to be both. And that's what makes leadership so hard, right? If you've ever been a leader, if you've ever been asked to be a leader and you've refused to be a leader, it's because you know leadership is hard. You're supposed to balance and be filled both full of grace and full of truth at the same exact time. That as I'm dealing with people, I've got to have a conviction to stand on the truth of the Word of God, but I've also got to be gentle with them. I can't hit them over the head or punch them in the face when I'd like to, right? You've got to be gentle. And you've got to be truth-driven, too. That's, what Jesus, uh, that's how John describes Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 14, that he was full of grace and full of truth. And so as we're thinking through this, and we're thinking about how leadership is supposed to be, and you see some deficiencies in some of your leaders, here's what you do. Do you criticize them? No. You pray for them. And you hope that they grow in the areas that they're lacking. All right, finally, hope for your spiritual leaders to be sacrificial with God's calling like a father. Paul continues this metaphor of the family. He's already compared his compassion for them to that of a mother in regards to her kids. And now in verses 9 through 12, he's going to continue this family metaphor, and he's going to use a father now. And he's going to compare the father's sacrifices that he makes in order to serve the family, and he's going to talk about how he is a spiritual father who's made sacrifices to, uh, to serve the Thessalonians. Make a note of this. The sacrifice of working hard to provide. How many of you had a father who worked hard? Did you ever have a dad who worked hard? Yep. He provided for you so that you wouldn't have to worry or be burdened by where the next meal is coming from or am I going to have a roof over my head or am I going to have clothes to wear? We have dads who work hard. And sometimes because they worked hard, they weren't always as present in our lives as maybe we would have liked them to be. But make no mistake about it, they were working hard because they loved you. And that's what Paul says in verse 9. He says, For you recall, brethren, our labor and our hardship, how working night and day is to not be a burden to any of you. We proclaim to you the gospel of God. Paul uses two words here to describe the work ethic that he had. He uses labor and he uses hardship. In the original Greek language, those two words rhyme. And while they are related, they mean different things. Labor, labor means the arduous task of working hard. Hardship is the exhaustion you feel after you've done the labor. Have you ever known what it's like to understand that there's work, but then there's the hardship of how you feel after you've done the work? Maybe blisters, maybe sore bones, just a bad back. And how many of you learned hard work from your dad? Paul is pleading with the Thessalonians, and he's like, I need you to remember how hard we worked and how exhausted we were. Call that to mind. We learn tenderness from our moms. 
We learn hard work from our dads. Whatever it takes to put food on the table, to put a roof over your head, that's my job. I'm going to provide. I'm on it. Secondly, the sacrifice to live to a higher standard. Verse 10, You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you believers. You see, like it or not, your spiritual leaders of the church are under constant scrutiny for the decisions they make for themselves and their family, how their kids are behaving in church, but also the decisions that they make for the church as a whole. And that's the cost of leadership. We understand it and we accept it. There are people who are counting on us. And when you have people who are counting on you to set an example by which to live, you refrain from doing the things that maybe everybody else is doing. Now that doesn't mean that your spiritual leaders are perfect in this regard or that we have it all together all the time. We are human just like you are and we sin. But we're trying. We understand that you're counting on us to live our lives to a high standard and that we're trying to call you to live to that same high standard. The sacrifice to live to a high standard. Be hopeful that your leaders are leading by their example for you on how to live life. And then finally, the sacrifice to work to mature his kids. Verse 11 is very interesting. He says, Just as you know how we were exhorting you and encouraging you and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. Paul uses three specific verbs here. Exhorting and encouraging and imploring. And guess what? All three of those verbs have to do with how you use your words. He says, first of all, we, ex we were exhorting you. Exhorting you is the word, the Greek word parakaleo. It means to call to one another or to call near. It's the kind of speaking which, what, which is meant to produce a particular effect. I call these convicting words. That, how many of your dads ever used any convicting words with you? Just wait till we get home. Convicting words. Oh yes, I'll straighten up and fly right now, right? I help bring you into this world, I will take you out of this world, right? Those are convicting words by your dad. Those are words of exhortation like, hey, we want you to live better than you're doing now. And sometimes your spiritual leaders have got to use words that are exhorting, are convicting. Paul says that we were encouraging you. I like that word. It means to console. It's to show empathy to one's situation. And fathers can offer encouraging words to their kids. Maybe when your son or daughter was cut from the team or didn't get to, to, uh, to play in the game as much as what they would have liked and they're disappointed by that. As a father, you can come up and be like, man, I'm so sorry. I know you worked really hard. I'm sorry you didn't get to play. Or when they do succeed and they make the honor roll for the first time, man, I'm so proud of you. I know you could do it. Those are encouraging words by a father and they're needed and all too often our fathers and our spiritual leaders are really good at exhorting us telling us what we shouldn't be doing um, and not always good at encouraging us and so pray and hope for your leaders that better things are ahead for tomorrow and that we would be better at exhorting and encouraging and then he says the third word that he uses we were imploring you it's the Greek word maturamai. It means to affirm or to summons as a witness. It is, uh, uh, it, these are words that are appealing to a higher authority. You know, I think of when you stand on a, uh, a witness stand and you, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. You're calling upon a higher authority for their life. And that's what this is. And that's what um, your spiritual leaders are supposed to do as well. Point you to the higher authority for your life. These are the three words that Paul uses as he talks to the Thessalonians as a father would talk to his kids. And just as a father takes on the immense responsibility to be their kid's biggest cheerleader and advocate, he also takes on the responsibility to be their disciplinarian when they need it. And that's exactly what Paul was doing as the spiritual leader of the Thessalonian church. 
Man, hope that your spiritual leaders would be uh, servants who would be willing to step into your life to give you a quick, swift kick in the pants when you needed it, but also wrapped an arm around you and gave you some encouragement when you needed it, or a shoulder to cry on when life is hard and it hurts, but always appealing to a higher authority. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Jesus Christ died for you. Live, therefore, in a manner worthy to which He called you to live. And that's really the goal. If you look here in verse 12, why would we, why would we use these words with you? Why would we encourage you and implore you and, and exhort you? Uh, here's why. So that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into His own kingdom and glory. That's the goal. Train kids to grow up and to mature, to walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls them. That's the motivation of why we do what we do. Spiritual maturity. All right. Well, there it is. That is what you are to hope your spiritual leaders in this church will be. That they would be faithful with God's truth like a servant, but at the same time being gentle with God's people like a mother, while at the same time being sacrificial with their calling like a father. And maybe as you've reviewed this list and you're thinking about your spiritual leaders and you can quickly determine which spiritual leaders are not living up to these three standards, um, pray for them. Pray for me. Hope for the best in them. Confidently expect that they are growing in the areas in which they are weak and they're trusting that God would help them in that. Can you do that? Will you do that? Next week, we're going to be talking about how the church works, and we're going to be talking about your role in this, what we hope for you. And so I hope that you'll come back next week. We'll go easy on you. We'll be gentle with you like a mother, okay? Promise you.